All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. Today we are meeting a little earlier. We have a superstar with us. We have a rock star with us of medicine, Dr. Paul Marek. So um, what we'll do is this. Let me quickly introduce Dr. Paul Marek for those who are new. For the cool beans who, who've already been here, they know that we have our king bean over here. So here is Dr. Paul Marek's introduction. Uh, so I am actually reading it from his site. So let me actually show you his introduction as well. So you can uh, feel free to read it as well. So here, this is the uh, profile of uh, Dr. Paul Marek, professor of internal medicine. Dr. Marek received his medical degree from the University of Witwatersand, Johannesburg, South Africa. He was an ICU attending at Bargawanath Hospital in Soweto, South Africa. During this time, he obtained a Master of Medicine degree, Bachelor of Science. Think about the overachievements that our rock star has over here. A bachelor of Science degree in Pharmacology, Diploma in Anesthesia, as well as Diploma in Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Doc, Dr. Marek did a Critical Care Fellowship in London, Ontario, Canada, during which time he was admitted as a Fellow to the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, Canada. Dr. Marek has worked in various teaching hospitals in the US since 1992. He is board certified in internal medicine, critical care medicine, neurocritical care, and nutritional science. Dr. Marek is currently professor of medicine and chief of pulmonary and critical care medicine, Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia. Dr. Marek has written over 400 peer reviewed journal articles, 50 book chapters and authored four critical care books. So this is Dr. Marek uh, and his colleagues, uh, Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance. So in terms of our prophylactic supplements, vitamin D, C, quercetin, zinc, and melatonin. Next. So I'm going to cover just a, a few of them. This is uh, from this is uh, from what Dr. Fauci said. So this is a news report. So Dr. Fauci says, I would not mind recommending vitamin C. I do take it myself. So vitamin, So although the NIH cannot recommend for or against vitamin D, Dr. Fauci himself takes vitamin D. And in addition, Dr. Fauci says he takes vitamin C. Again, the NIH cannot make a recommendation for or against vitamin C. And yet Dr. Fauci himself, who knows better, takes vitamin C and vitamin D. Next. So I think vitamin D is important because particularly in winter, particularly those people of color, particularly obese people, particularly elderly people, particularly people in the north, you're at high risk of vitamin D deficiency. And we know that as your vitamin D levels fall, your risk of developing COVID go up. Next slide. We know that people who die of COVID have much lower levels of vitamin D than those who survive. Next slide. So this is a study. This is actually a systematic review and meta-analysis of vitamin D deficiency. And the summary is vitamin D insufficiency increases hospitalization and mortality from COVID-19. So this is not a difficult concept to understand. Vitamin D has really important immunological properties. It's important for T cell function. It, uh, it, it mitigates the cytokine storm. So, and we know that people who are vitamin D deficient or at higher risk, these are elderly people, people of color, obese people. So why in the heck are we not supplementing these people with vitamin D? It's such a cheap and effective intervention. Next slide. This is a study which was published just a few days ago, looking at the use of calcifidiol in patients admitted to hospital with SARS-CoV-2. So calcifidiol is 25 hydroxy vitamin D, so it's a more active form, so it reacts much more quickly and it achieves levels much quicker. So this was a cluster randomized trial, 550 patients randomized to calcifidiol and 379 controls. Though, what did they find in terms of ICU admission? 
those who were treated with the vitamin D, 5.4% versus 21% in controls, showing a dramatic reduction in ICU admission if you gave 25-hydroxy vitamin D. And again, you can see a reduction in mortality, 6% versus 15%. It remains mysterious to me why we do not promote the widespread use of vitamin D. It's safe and it appears to be very effective for both preventing and treating SARS-CoV-2. Next slide. So this is the um, Kaplan-Meier survival curve from that study. You can see dramatic reduction in mortality with calcifidiol. Next slide. So we're next, next going to talk about melatonin. So this is a bat. As we know, bats are the natural reservoir of, of, of coronaviruses. They harbor a whole host of coronaviruses, yet do not become symptomatic. One of the astonishing facts is that because they are nocturnal animals, bats have the highest concentration of melatonin of any other species on this planet. If you block their melatonin synthesis, they become symptomatic. So this provides a very interesting rationale why melatonin should actually work. Next slide. So melatonin actually, it's not just a molecule which makes you sleep. It has remarkable properties. It's probably one of the most potent antioxidant. And it, it, it neutralizes a whole host of reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen species. In addition, it has a, a, an extensive list of physiological properties. It's highly anti-inflammatory, which which is really important in SARS-CoV-2. And what it does, interestingly enough, increases ACE2 expression, which has a protective effect with SARS-CoV-2. So that's a, just a general summary. Next slide. What's very interesting about melatonin is melatonin specifically is a mitochondrial antioxidant. And we know that mitochondrion are the energy source of the body. All one's energy is made in the mitochondrion. If the mitochondrion suffers oxidant damage, you get impairment of energy production. So there are specific melatonin receptors on the mitochondrion, the M1 and M2. But what is intriguing, what is quite intriguing is mitochondrion actually can synthesize melatonin. And melatonin protects the mitochondrion from oxidative injury and is essential for an electron transport chain. Next slide. So one of the problems with SARS-CoV-2 is it switches off aerobic -like, uh, metabolism, switching to anaerobic glycolysis, so that the cell is more dependent on glucose uh, rather than um, entering the Krebs cycle. The, one of the consequences of this is that it doesn't, the mitochondrion cannot produce melatonin. So it becomes a vicious cycle that deficiency of melatonin promotes anaerobic metabolism, which indeed at the same time decreases melatonin production. So supplementing melatonin tends to reverse this change in energy utilization by mitochondrion. Next slide. So the question is, is there any data that that melatonin is of any benefit? Well, this was a study from Cleveland Clinic looking at risk factors for getting SARS-CoV-2. The most potentially impact, impactful is the reduced in, in the reduced risk of testing positive were patients on melatonin. So if you were taking melatonin, you had a significantly lower risk of developing uh, SARS-CoV-2. Next slide. This happens to be a randomized double-blind study in patients who were given. So these were hospitalized patients treated with melatonin. The, you can see it was a small, small randomized trial. These people weren't that sick, but there was a significant reduction in hospital stay and um, uh, in time to discharge. So again, in the small study showing time to discharge and return to baseline health, 
significantly better in the patients who receive melatonin. Next slide. So finally, there's the study out of New York, which looked at mortality in patients who intubated. So these are people in the ICU, and they found that if you're receiving melatonin, your, your hazard risk was 0.13. So there was a 90% risk of dying, a 90% risk of dying if you got melatonin. The p-value was so, there were so many zeros that they had to put it in exponential form. That's how highly significant it was. So again, here we have a molecule which is very cheap, very safe. It's probably one of the safest medications that will both reduce your risk of getting COVID and of dying of COVID. And I, it, 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 it's troublesome that this drug is not promoted more widely. Next slide. So how to control the, the pandemic? Um, so just to summarize some, some of the things I've said today, we need to inform and educate the public. We need to provide the truth. We need public health measures, mass social distancing, testing. We need prophylaxis in high-risk groups, and we need to prophylax vitamin D, melatonin, vitamin C, and ivermectin in high-risk groups. Early treatment at home for symptomatic patients, really important to prevent progression of disease, to prevent the long haulers. And then finally, for those people who actually miss out on the earlier steps, those who arrive in hospital, we want to treat them with the math protocol early. This is not to say that vaccination doesn't have a role. Vaccination is important, but it, it, it's not the entire solution. It's going to take months, if not years, to, to vaccinate the entire population. And then we have the problem or the potential problem of mutants, mutant species, which may be less susceptible. So I think this is part of the overall package. So with that, thank you. Um, next slide. And I will take any questions.